Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. Hello, everyone. Future editing, Brittany. For the first few minutes of the podcast, my mic struggled to pick up my audio. It's just for the first few minutes, so please bear with me. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for the Thought Spot for joining me. Hello, you guys. My name is Irene. My channel is The Thought Spot on YouTube. Um, I basically just talk about my autistic and ADHD experience on there, and I also provide tools for neurodivergent folks to better integrate their neurodivergence into their life if they so choose to take the tools that I give them. And yeah, um, that's about it. I just look to build a community where people can not only understand their neurodivergence better, but to actually work on appreciating their neurodivergence and accommodating accommodating their neurodivergence. So my audience loves you already, so that's like a given, but I also <laughs> have been loving when you review New Girl. That's like my, my new favorite thing is people reviewing, especially TV shows, but I love New Girl, and that has been so fun to watch you do that. Oh yeah, I freaking love New Girl, and it's exciting to see people respond well to it because that's kind of what I do all the time when I'm watching stuff is I'm, I'm analyzing it from a conceptual introspective point of view and I have no one to talk about it with. So I just, I, I watch new girl with that point of view and there's other shows too, where there's clearly autistic characters where I'm like, should I start branching out into other shows like Queens Gambit? Have you seen Queens Gambit? No, no, I haven't seen that. Um, but I've heard good things about it. I love the main character, Beth Harmon. She is so clearly autistic and I kind of want to review her character too. But yeah, I'm just gonna, it's exciting. It's love fun. It. Love it. I think that's so exciting. I've actually been reviewing Love is Blind. I just started the Mormon Wives show, the like secret oh life of Mormon wives. It's been really exciting. And I do, I do. My audience has a joke of like, take a shot every time Brittany says, are they neurodivergent? <laughs> <laughs> but I can't help it. I'm noticing a pattern. I'm just saying. And you know what? On Love is Blind, I have properly guessed a few people were neurodivergent. So I was like pretty excited. I was like, okay, what am I recognizing? Which actually swoops us right into today's topic about aesthetic and neurodivergence. This is a question that I've been pondering. How do you know someone's neurodivergent by just looking at them? And this is a hard question to answer because obviously you don't want to judge a book by its cover. And disclaimer, that is not what we're trying to do. We are just exploring ideas. Me personally, the way I read realized I was neurodivergent was actually realizing I looked like other people that were neurodivergent. And I was like, oh, I look like this category of person. Wait a second. We know people use aesthetics to express themselves. So what is it about neurodivergent aesthetic that sort of signals virgin? To answer that question really quick, I don't think you could just look at someone and know if they're neurodivergent. And then to kind of branch that out into a more broad or expand on that answer. I feel like there's certain patterns that I look for I, that I'm sure you also do when you're talking to people or observing people. So there's, you know, just the way that people process that I look out for, the way that they communicate that I look out for. Um, when it comes to just your aesthetics and what you look like on the external, I feel like it depends on the function in which you're using your aesthetics. I think that's what I usually look out for when I'm trying to see if someone's neurodivergent or not is, is this person using aesthetics to express themselves or are they using aesthetics to make a statement on what their proximity to society is? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that makes total yeah. sense. Well, I feel like so much of aesthetic is safety has to play a role in aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So when I think about aesthetic, I think about for myself personally, I think about how safe am I to express myself? Who am I signaling to? Like when I lived in Seattle, as an example, I felt the safest in my aesthetic because everyone was kind of weird and it kind of worked. And even if you were a tech guy, you had a very specific aesthetic, but you didn't look weird standing next to the goth at the bus stop. Because everybody yeah. was so free to express themselves. So when I look at people and I notice they have like rebellious energy or they're willing to stand out, a part of me always goes to, okay, are you standing out? Because that we're so aware of it. We're aware of the script. We know when we're standing out. I don't think we're ignorant to that fact. So if we know we're standing out, why? And so a part of me has to ask, is it the neurodivergent like sense of expression 
Or is it actually just that you're a neurotypical rebel who's like F the man, you know, and that comes into play for me, which is why I do think I agree with you. You can't look at someone and literally know they're neurodivergent. I don't think you could ever literally know anything about a person. You can't read minds. But I wonder if in some ways it's kind of a benefit. Like I know as a queer person, when other people recognize me as queer, it's like exciting. It's like, oh my God, thank you for seeing me. But Mm. how would they have seen me? How would they know I was queer? What am I signaling about my attitude or aesthetic that says that to them? Or I'll notice that I'll do that with other queer people too, where I'm like, are you queer? And they're like, oh my God, I am. Thank you so much. And it's just like, it feels like a compliment. So maybe in some way it's scary because of discrimination. And then other ways it's like, oh my gosh, I feel so seen. I feel so understood, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like honestly, what it is, is you, you just learn more and more about a person and what their patterns are and why they're using those patterns in their life. And that's kind of how you figure out if someone's neurodivergent is as you get to know, you know, why do they dress this way? That's when you start to understand, oh, okay, this is what it means to them. And if it means that to them, then that means they're probably neurodivergent because someone dressing differently because they want to express themselves in that certain way in a space where it's not safe to do so is completely different than someone dressing extremely differently because everyone else is, and it's just safe to do that. And maybe even that's how you fit in is to have blue hair and dressing up really weird. Um, And so it's not the same if everyone is dressing that way and looking that way. And it's, it's almost like a peer pressure to look that way too, then going out of your way and putting yourself out there, despite everyone else looking different and seeing you as different and expressing yourself in that way, because that's just who you are. So I feel like because of that, you just have to get to know a person and see, okay, where, what are they about? What are, what life circumstances do they come from? And how did that affect them as a person? And that's how you start to build their story out, you know? Yeah. Have you ever heard the story about Kat Von D who, when she, you know how she became a Christian? Do you know that? I vaguely know something like that, but I don't know the details of it. Okay. It doesn't matter literally, but she became like a Christian and went on her whole weird journey and she is super goth and a lot of the Christians won't embrace her. And they Mm -hmm. say that like her goth expression is signaling devil worship And then she went to a Jordan Peterson event and she was very confused on how this group of quote free thinkers were dressed all the same and why her husband and her stood out in the crowd. And she goes, where are your tattoos? Where is your rebellion? Where's your goth? Where's your like aesthetic? Like, where's your expression? Do you guys all dress the same for a reason? And a part of me was surprised. She didn't realize like you're in a different particular bubble that signals a particular thing with aesthetic. And so in my brain, I kind of wondered, you know, these like as we move through life as people and if we want to be a part of communities we're you know that means so many things but then we sort of do end up looking like people or dressing like people so if we're in a neurodivergent safe community like i'm always telling my offline friends get online neurodivergent communities exist here but they they aren't finding them in real life they're only find like i'm finding them online they're finding they're not finding them in you know in real life so i said look like once you join a group there, yes, is a pressure to feel like aesthetically similar. And so they're going to have expectations of you, but you have to decide how to find that balance with who you are and who the group is. But also that is the sort of push and pull of being a person in a society and signaling to the society. So like when you said blue hair is the norm, like in certain bubbles, yeah, like the blue hair piercings, tattoos is the norm. And when you look, let's say, preppy we're going super generalized here but if you go like super preppy all of a sudden you're signaling something different maybe even subtle judgment have you ever heard that like oh preppy people are judging me simply because they're preppy maybe for sure maybe yeah or maybe that's just the aesthetic they're playing into so that's so there's judgment even so and you know what some of the most judgmental people i know are neurodivergent people because they don't mean i don't think they I don't know if they mean to be a lot of the time. Sometimes they are, but sometimes like I even do this on stream. I'm really struggling with not pointing out something that I notice. And I'm like, is this mean for me to point out like 
that these boys are showing up looking like they haven't brushed their teeth today and how do they get away with it? But it's like that rude to say because they're neurodivergent. So maybe they didn't have the spoons today. But also, why do they all show up looking like they haven't showered? But like a girl could never. But also, is that sexism? It's like, should I not point out that people and then I feel bad about pointing out that their aesthetic mm. is displeasing. But then I know it's because I think it plays a role in their neurodivergency. That's something I've been thinking a lot about for, you know, the past few months is the difference between being observational and judgmental, because I think that conversation is really important to distinguish when you are neurodivergent, you know, especially if you're autistic, because we really do get lost in so many different observational details. And we, we process that as genuine information because yeah. every little thing matters. It's, it's giving you so much invisible information that you don't know about. Like your typical people are able to understand the invisible, um, you know, context or what someone's actually trying to say, but for autistic folks, folks, it's more so a pattern recognition. So if you notice someone has dirty teeth or doesn't take care of their teeth, you could kind of have that branch out into, okay, well, their hygiene's not great. Why? Is it because they can't afford it? Is it because they don't have time? Is it because they're disabled and aren't able to take care of themselves? And then as you get to know other parts of them, you start to make connections of, okay, I'm starting to understand you a little bit more. And what I feel like is such a shame is when there's observational people like you and you're wanting to talk about these observations um, because it's so important for the way that you process and for the conversation. People automatically think that you're passing judgment when I don't think you are. I feel like judgment is taking an observation and tying a label to it. So you don't brush your teeth, you're dirty and you're lazy. You know, that's a judgment. But if you're just saying, oh, this person isn't clean, they're not brushing their teeth, that's just a fact. That's just an observation. And I feel like people don't know how to un take in observational facts without tying it to a judgment. Right. Because we're so judgmental as a society and contextual. And this is how a lot of autistic people get in trouble because we'll say something like, oh, I noticed that you're doing your hair different. And then people who are used to translating stuff, like what's the underlying meaning will be like, oh, are you actually complimenting me or is that a diss? Mm -hmm. And then usually people think autistic folks are dissing them because we'll make an observation when in reality, it's just the most common thing I see neurodivergent people say is that's interesting because it's so neutral. It's just like, I noticed this thing, it made me you know, spark a thing in my brain and I'm not passing judgment on if it's good or bad, but it's interesting. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Okay. First of all, my audience is going to laugh because I say interesting like so much. It would just mean <laughs> something to think about, something to think about. Okay. I, right away. Okay. I wrote down the subtle information is interesting because I think neurotypical people will see like if when I, when I observe somebody and I'll say like, oh, they look like they rolled out of bed and didn't even brush their teeth and just showed up to this event. I don't think lazy. I think neurotypical okay. people think lazy and gross. I think, oh, what spoons went into brushing your teeth today? Did they take too many spoons so you decided to skip it? Or, oh, maybe they didn't have the spoons to do their hair today. Maybe it was this, like we were, we were watching somebody the other day with OCD and I was like, oh, maybe their OCD is playing a role. Oh, maybe, or maybe it's just patriarchy and men get to show up no matter what they look like and get paid millions of dollars while women have to go through all of these other loops. Or maybe, who knows what it is really, but it's like, okay, what does that mean? Now, I will say, I noticed that negative words are what I cast as judgment. So whether it's coming from an autistic person or a neurodivergent person or a neurotypical person, if they observe something you like and insult it, then I'm going to take that as an insult. Like, not literally personally, because I'm better at that, but I mean... I, I'm assuming they mean it as an insult. Like, oh, you like that ugly dress or, oh, that's such a disgusting color. Oh, I can't believe you like that. Anything like that, I'm going to assume like they, even if they don't know it, like it's rude. And the rudeness I feel is so unnecessary in like an optimistic or positive person that I'm like, why are you saying that out loud? But then even that I'm willing to dissect as something more nuanced because I think people like, I don't know if you grew up in a home like this, but you know, I grew up in a very blunt home. My parents are very judgmental in a sense. They're very like, I don't like it. Like, no, 
ugly, not your dress, doesn't look good on you, change it. And a part of me is like grateful. Another part of me is like, but I really like it. Like growing up, my mom would say, do not wear purple. You look horrible in purple, but I love purple. But you know what? She was right. It makes my teeth look really yellow. When I wear I purple clothes, my teeth go yellow. Yeah. I feel like that's such an immigrant thing. I don't know if, if they would be the same um, if they were in their home country, but my parents are the same way. Like my mom growing up would be so brutal. Like you're wearing that to school. Oh, you look fat. Are yep. you sure you want to eat that second bowl of rice? Um, and yes, I am sure girl. Give me that second bowl. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you don't chew your food. You just swallow it. And then she's True. just like, <laughs> how does she she's know like, don't me? wear black. <laughs> she's like, why do you wear black? That's so masculine, you know? Um, and I'm sure there's some cultures that are just more blunt than others, but mm -hmm. I do think there's something about the immigrant experience where it's such a specific thing when you're in a country where you're not used to the culture or the language. And I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's something about like the only familiarity you have is, is within your home and with your family. And you almost have to mask a little bit with the external world with the majority of the external world and maybe something about that makes immigrant families or parents be a lot more blunt because it's almost like I can't get this out in any other place. I have to be so hyper cautious in society. So I, I want to just be able to be very straightforward at home and I need to, you know? Ooh, that's a great point actually. Yeah, actually, wait, that's a great point because I might even feel that way about myself. Like I because, you know, I'm a streamer and I spend a lot of time giving my opinions. But even there, I try to mitigate well, always harm, but I always try to like mitigate the harshness. Like I try to be, even though I can be I'm known for being pretty blunt in private in my own home. You want to talk about blunt like the way I try to censor myself as a streamer and I'm already how the irony of me saying I'm censoring myself and I'm still known as like, oh, Brittany's really blunt. Like Brittany ends her sentence with a period. And then I'm like, you should see me when the cameras are off. Like now that I'm being cruel or mean behind closed doors, but I'm being even more accurate. Like I think I'm being even more specific, but that's because I don't have to think about who's hearing me. I don't have yeah. to think about translating it. Like we reviewed this very nice lady on the internet a while back and I had no other like word to describe her except dusty, but I was like, I don't mean it. Like, and I, 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 I laughed so hard. I, like, <laughs> I, prefaced, I love your bluntness. No, listen, I prefaced it with, I don't mean literally her. Like I just meant like her aura. Like she seemed yeah. like, I, needed, I know like, exactly what you're you saying. Know? And I, and everyone's like, Brittany, you're so mean. Like the comment sections are still so mad at me. And I was like, I'm, I really am not. I just mean her or like, she's not shining. She's not like, ah, like, you know, just like I laughed <laughs> when you said dusty, I immediately knew what you're saying. <laughs> and I laughed because I was like, yes, yeah, agreed. Okay. So then I, then I, okay. That directly plays into aesthetic for me when I look at people and like, that's why I feel like I'm, I, pr well, maybe this is because this is my as everyone points out, like my obsession is categorization and I want to be really accurate. I want to be right about how I put people in boxes because I know yeah. how horrible it is to be mislabeled. But I also mm -hmm. think labels help us recognize ourselves, or at least it helps me. So even when I say something like, oh, I wonder if they're autistic, I'm not saying that as a denigrating statement. I'm saying this might help you to figure this out because it helped me to figure out things about my brain. So this might actually be a benefit to you versus like a curse. But I think sometimes people think I'm cursing them with neurodivergence with like a, a, a personality disorder or something like they're like, Oh my God, Brittany thinks this person has something. I'm just, I mean it in the way that you would help a friend out. Like, Oh, hey, like my friend helped me with gluten this month. They're like, Hey, take gluten out of your diet. Boom. I feel so much better. You know, I feel like my whole life has changed. I feel great. But you know what I mean? It's like, sometimes we are not casting judgment so much as trying to help. But I will say again, the way that my brain processes, whether or not it's an insult, even if they don't mean it to be, is if they use like really mean words. And I guess dusty for some people could be a mean word, but for me, it's like a description of like a, like if you're, 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 you know, your baseboards are dusty. It doesn't mm -hmm. moralize. I'm not moralizing the baseboards being dusty. Yeah. But I think for some people, maybe they feel that way. And by the way, my baseboards are very dusty. <laughs> okay. That's the thing is you have to figure out and use your own um, 
deductive reasoning and critical thinking to figure out what is this person like and how do they personally process? Because if someone else outside of you were to describe another person as dusty, it would be seen as mean. But because I know that you process things in a different way, like you're not, I feel like it's very clear that you're not interested in passing judgment. If anything, you're the opposite. I feel like the the opposite is just trying to understand someone. So a very judgmental person isn't interested in actually having information. They right. just selectively pick out whatever information they need from you and they fit it into the mold that they want to see you in. Whereas for you, you're taking in all information unbiasedly and whether it's good or bad, and you let that shape what you see in the person or how you um, understand them. And you're always willing to understand people more or a situation more. And so because of that, I feel like for me, it's it's a given that you're not a judgmental person. So when you're saying things like, oh, she <laughs> she's dusty, I laugh because I'm like, I know for a fact you're not passing judgment. It's just an observation. And so from like the way my mind works too is like, oh, I'll go in and observe her in the same ways. And I'm like, yes, that's true. I, I see that dustiness now that she brought it up. And that's just, for me, it's freeing to see people like you make observations like that because those are things I think to myself too when I'm processing other people but I don't really necessarily say it out loud, sure. but it's freeing to see other people make same observations or similar observations to me. Cause I'm like, yes, I resonate with that. And it yeah. helps me feel connected and less alone and things like that. You know, I appreciate that. And I will say as a streamer, I'm really lucky that I get to in real time, get a lot of feedback very quickly about my observations. So a lot of the time I'm seeing like 200 people react to me and they're giving me oh. insight and it's, it's, you know, it's nice. It's overwhelming. Though. it's overwhelming, but it's really nice too. like, um, uh, Oh wait, hold on. I was thinking about you know how you made, okay, you know how, I lost my train of thought there, but I'm going to try to get it back. You remember how you made a video about aesthetic and people yeah. had time to process and then comment on your video and they didn't get to in real time have a conversation with you and they, so they couldn't give you the benefit of the doubt. One of the things I get as a streamer is sort of the benefit of the doubt where people can say, wait, Brittany, do you mean this? Because this is what I feel like is this. And like, oh, Brittany, do you mean this? It's like they get to actually talk to me because one of the things that I've really appreciated about my audience is like when I, especially when I physically act out or give a visual, they're like, oh, I get it. Once they, okay. I give them the right tool, then they're like, oh my God, I get it. But if you, it depends on how you take in information. So I know, at least through my own lived life, that when I observe a person, what I do is I create like a painting in my head. Like when I met you, I had a painting in my head. And as you tell me information, I update the painting with the new information. And as you are like, let's say you were like, I love guitar. And I was like, okay, I'll paint a guitar in Irene's picture. And then you're like, I hate guitar. I like erase the guitar. And then like, I add things to it. And then that visual is how I remember like what Irene likes and who she is and like the things about her that are specific. And so mm -hmm. that's, I don't think that other people are doing that necessarily. I think a lot of people go, this is how I see this person and this is who they are forever. Like as a content creator, one of the things I see on Twitter mostly, and this is why I block everybody on Twitter and I love doing it, is I will put a video out. Like I just recently put one out and I saw this this morning, so it's on my mind, where I'll put a video out, I'll get a question from an audience member, I'll title the video, like the question, like, so the podcast last week was a question someone sent me, is it abnormal that my husband is my only friend? Like, should I have other friends? So yeah. I put that in the title, I posted my video and people responded on Twitter to me as if I was talking about myself. And then they were like, see how crazy Brittany is. She's in an abusive relationship just based off the title. But the podcast is even about me. And by the way, that mm -hmm. person I don't even think is in an abusive relationship. Like that's the irony, right? So I think that's how a lot of people are operating. I think a lot of people are operating on people as if they're reading the headlines of an article. And I'm like, okay, but what's the article say? Yeah. And that pisses people off because they're like, Brittany, it's obvious. The title says it all. And I'm like, but it doesn't. So I actually think 
when I look at people and I put them in a box, it's a box that's a bubble. So it's like see-through and transparent and poppable and movable and shapeable and it's not permanent. But I think when mm-hmm. other people do it, they're being permanent. And that's why when I judge, people think it's permanent judgment, but it's just gay judgment. I'm just like, what, what, what like, you know, flavor of ice cream are you? Yeah. Even if I don't like banana girl, if you're a banana split, I love that for you. Mm-hmm. And I think that this plays a role in how we observe aesthetic, which is why, again, I'm ranting. But like when I see a neurodivergent aesthetic, I'm like, and I'm excited. I'm not judging. I'm observing to discern like compatibility. Yeah. That's the thing is there is definitely social norms, whether or not people want to disagree with that. Um, there are social norms everywhere you go. I think one really interesting thing is, is that there's times where I'll make videos. I made a video semi recently about this woman from the Netherlands that moved to Japan. And I've noticed that in more homogenous countries like Japan, for example, or the Netherlands, um, there's a very specific social norm there. And social norm is the way people look, dress, socialize, talk. Uh, lifestyle choices and whatnot. And what's interesting is I realize in these videos, because I'll ask people to comment on those videos if they're from different countries to talk about their social norms. And what I've come to realize is the US just has so many different people that it's hard to pin down a social norm because Mm -hmm. of that. And I think that ends up causing so many issues, Um, different issues, right? There's issues in more homogenous countries where you can't express yourself as freely, but there's a a problem in the U S where it's almost like there's so many different ways to express yourself that whatever thing you choose in some spaces, it'll be understood, but depending on who's observing you, they will completely misunderstand because they'll see these specific traits and connect it to another trait that may or may not be true. So if someone sees that you're goth or if someone sees that you dress preppy, um, they might judge you to be a uh, classist or, or um, you think you're better than everyone, you know, things like that. And that may not even be true. And that gets really complicated when there's just so many different cultures and generations and things like that. And I feel like, um, like what you said, when you were describing the painting metaphor, that's exactly how I, understand people too, is I'm just gathering information. And a lot of the times it's like you get the outline first, you have a general idea of who they are. And then as you get more information, you're filling in little blocks of color. And then if you ever get to the point where you're filling in details, it's like you you don't pass judgment it, it takes a lot for us to get to a point where we're passing judgment. And even then we could have the full picture and still not pass judgment. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is new information. This is interesting. Even though this may conflict with all these other things I know about you, it doesn't confuse me. If anything, it allows me to understand you even deeper, totally. you know? And I feel like neurotypical or socially normal people don't process that way because we're so used to needing to pass judgment right away without knowing more information. We're not socialized to want to understand each other more. We're socialized to have to respond and make decisions. And, you know, it's interlaced in the way that we live our lives. And it's also interlaced in the way that we talk to each other. Like one really common thing I come across when I work with my one-on-one clients is I find that they a lot of the times come to me and they try to talk to me in a neurotypical way. So they'll try to summarize what they want to say to me in a few sentences. And it takes them a long time to do that. And they have a really difficult time. And I'll always stop them and I'll say, just jump into it. Tell me a random story in as much detail as possible. You don't need to know what the point of it is or whether or not that connects to the next thought that it reminds you of. Because the way that neurodivergent people process is we just have all these little things and we could get so lost in the details and we may not know what the full picture is yet, but we just, in our brains, they're interleaked somehow. And 
but but your typical people don't like to talk that way they don't like to get lost in a story they're like what's the point of you talking 30 minutes Ugh. about coffee like what does that have to do with work or or anything people just want to get the summary the title like what are you doing this weekend um how's your job how's your dating life and then they need you to summarize it really quick and then they judge you if you're neurodivergent and you tend to get really lost in something that is insignificant but as a neurodivergent person myself, I feel like those details and those stories actually reveal so much information. Yeah. As yeah. long as you're willing to actually listen and understand them for what they're trying to say to you rather than how do I um, how do I understand it from my own point of view? And what if I were to tell the story, what would that mean? And placing that and projecting that onto the person, you know? I, I will say a part of it is probably a certain level of emotional labor because when a person talks, I see it as an opportunity to know how their brain works. But just having that thought, just to say out loud, oh, how does your brain work? That's not a neurotypical thought. And based off the feedback I'm getting, people go, everyone's brain works the same, Brittany. And I'm like, mm, yeah, if only. And they're like, well, then something's wrong with you. And I was like, well, something specific about your brain. Everyone's brain is specific. And in the past, I've noticed that one of the compliments I've given people that no matter who they are, they blush when I do it is when I'm like, oh, my God, I love your brain. And they're like, oh, and like that. They know what I mean when I say that. But they don't know what I mean when I'm like, well, how does your brain work? Like, what kind of brain do you have? And that getting uh, I get the feedback all the time. This is why I actually recently stopped doing collaborations with a lot of people. Basically, I, I kept trying to do these panels and people would be like, you're getting lost in the weeds. Like, why are you why are you connecting all these things? And I was like, when you ask a question like, how do we solve the gender gap? It's like, OK, well, that's not a straightforward question. That's a very convoluted, like layered, nuanced, very difficult question. So the audacity of these YouTubers to get on a panel and be like, let's solve the gender crisis in a simple sentence. OK, girl, if that could be done, we would have done it, you know. So it's kind of like a level of annoyance I have with people looking at me like I'm the one who can't think about these things like in depth. But I'm like, you are the one who are asking me for a simple answer. And so now I'm confused about like the expectation which is again, like why I'm excited to do collabs with you, because at least I know we can explore and think, and it's not, it's like, we're throwing things at the wall to see what sticks versus coming into the conversation with this, like, I know what's good for everybody and I can make a prescription and it's so frustrating, but yeah, I couldn't even tell you the amount of times my whole family, the way we deviate from the initial conversation into 20 different tangents, just to get back to the original one, like seven hours later, I also grew up with a whole family like this, which is why I'm like, how many y'all, how many y'all neurodivergent? I already, we already have like four diagnoses in the family. Okay, girl. So that means like, I'm looking at everybody like who else, who else? And like stuff like that is very telling. I think about what feels most safe, how you feel the most understood, a person letting you monologue can feel so safe because you're really getting it all out. You're really having a moment to express yourself, but I can see why neurotypicals might see that as like a arrogant or egotistical or a I'm the main character kind of moment. Cause I'm sure when some people monologue, they're just trying to be the center of attention. But I think when other people do it, they just don't even know, like they're just expressing themselves and they don't know where to stop. And I think that's so cute. I'll see that on my discord where sometimes if there's no one talking on the VC, someone will feel a need to be like, we have to fill the space. We have to fill it with, with noise. And I'm like, no unnecessary talking needed. You can, if you feel like you have something to share, but this is like a safe space to allow silence to occur. I love silence in a conversation. What a beautiful moment mm -hmm. to ponder. Yeah. But talk about uncomfortable with a lot of people. And by the way, I do think the way you talk is an aesthetic. Oh yeah. What does that mean? I think you communicate so much with how you speak. It tells people what region you're from in the world. It can tell people how you grew up. It can tell people, um, you know, uh, like even the way you s like structure sentences, like mm -hmm. I kind of, I kind of do pretty well with different people's sentence structures, but I've noticed that it can confuse people, but I'm like, oh, they're just from a different place. This is how they express like language. Oh, this is how they use this word. This is why, like, that's why I always say like, what bubble are we in? How to use the word? And people are like, words mean the same thing. 
if words meant the same, you know, everywhere, girl, we wouldn't be having all these miscommunications. So I'm like, what is this about? What is this language meant to communicate to me? And I think people might even change the way they talk in order to signal aesthetic or to be a part of a group. Or if it's like, it's like learning slang. Do you ever meet, like, I remember being a middle schooler and I would start saying freaking, I was like, freaking. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm like using slang, you know? And my dad, he goes, Brittany, why do you keep saying freaking every two words? I was like, um, cause I freaking want to. And he's like, okay, we're banning the word. And I was like, oh. and like, it was so annoying. I remember being so annoying about it, thinking I was so cool, but I was trying to like signal that I wanted to be in this in crowd. I was telling, I was like explaining my, I wanted to be rough and I wanted to be like bold and I wanted to express like a, I'm, I'm tough. Like I say, frick. You know, 12 year old Brittany was very determined to be seen as tough. Mm. So even her language was like based off that aesthetic desire of being perceived a particular way. Yeah. Well, I noticed that that's something a lot of neurodivergent people end up apologizing for when we're conversing with other people is, oh, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent or I'm getting um, off track or getting lost in the weeds. And Whenever I talk to other neurodivergents that say stuff like that, I always feel like it's such a shame because for me, I'm like, let yourself process the way you need to. Like, just because other people would get frustrated with you because you're not getting to the point, because essentially you're becoming useless to them, right? You're giving them useless information. Doesn't mean that what you say and the connections you're making in your head isn't valuable. And um, there's one thing I learned online, it's called dolphining, I think. And I feel like that's such a great metaphor for how neurodivergence think, because when you see dolphins surface on one end of the ocean and they go under and then they surface on another end to you, you're like, oh my God, how did they get there? But then if you were to be underwater, you'd see that there's like a whole like path that they're swimming to get to that point. I feel like that's a lot of the times how we think. So we'll talk about something, it'll make us think about something else. And then we'll go into that thought and then explore it. And then I feel like that's just kind of how neurodivergence need to process is just getting to talk about all of these stories that interlinks with another concept or idea. And then we don't really get to the point until at the very end when we fully explore the whole picture. And it's so frustrating to talk to people who don't think in that way because before you can even arrive to that conclusion, they're just like, so what is it? Do you like this person or not? Do you think this is a good situation or bad situation? And then you're just like, I don't know. I, I feel like I have to fully explore this first. And then I could give you that answer, but you're not letting me because you're so impatient. And I wonder how much of that just has to do with our society being capitalistic and needing to be run on a certain time and everything has to be useful. And it's almost like, whether or not people are conscious of it or not. And I'm not saying people are good or bad. It's just people tend to be selfish in a way where they're like, I need you to be useful to me more or less um, in order for me to give you time. Um, whereas I feel like for neurodivergence, information isn't about how useful or not it is. It's just about understanding. So the purpose of ingesting information is different. I feel like for neurodivergence versus neurotypicals, I feel like neurodivergence like information to understand regardless of it being useful to them. And I feel like neurotypicals only want to digest information that they could immediately use to their advantage, whether it's socially or, um, you know, intellectually and things like that and anything outside of it, they don't care. So how often do you see neurotypical people not even care to get to know someone? Or there's been so many times in my life where I'm like, why did that person do this? And I'll keep thinking about it and I'm fixated on it. And then my neurotypical friend would be like, why do you care? You're not friends with them. You're never going to talk to them again. Like just move on from it. And I'm like, just because we will never see them again, doesn't mean that processing why they did something isn't super interesting and I want to do it. Like why does information have to be useful for you, for you to be interested? And it's just, I don't know. I think that's interesting. <laughs> no, I, I would argue that it's very useful. They just don't see the usefulness in it because yeah. you're really asking like, oh, why did this? I mean, 
I think anyone who's curious about humans will ask, why did they do that? And I think for maybe another person, they might only see the negatives of latching onto it instead of like growing from a perspective of understanding the mechanism of being a person. And to be mm. fair, it's pretty typical for neurodivergent people to observe people as a way to understand themselves. At least that seems to be my experience where my interest in people is my interest in myself ultimately. Like, oh, why did you do this? Why do I do this? And I think dolphining is such a great, great example of exactly what it's like. There is a thread here. It all makes sense. It's all connected. Just let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. But also useful information is such a funny idea. I put out a podcast a couple weeks ago and I got a comment and the person was like, hey, I think you should have one of your friends review your podcast. It might really help for you to like get to the point quickly and like summarize your thoughts in a more concise way. And I was like, it's a 50 minute podcast relax. Like you can't sit through 50 minutes, but also that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Because that's probably not the person that like, I watch podcasts all day and all the podcasts I watch, the best part about them is that they're free flowing, that they're throwing ideas at the wall, that there is no, there is no, nothing, nobody is concise because that's kind of like the joy of it. And even though my pods tend to be very like specifically different than my streams where I really do monologue forever and I rant, like even then, it's like, I think what this person is trying to express to me is I, as an individual, don't like the way you formatted your podcast. So I'm going to give you advice that makes me more comfortable to listen in the future. The dilemma is that they didn't consider that maybe they're not the demographic I'm making content for. And I think that's another element of like, oh, why did you do this? Why did you write this comment to me? Why did you, why did you give me this information? Like, again, I think there's probably a reason for it, but I think they're also trying to help in a weird way. I think people genuinely think that if if they can they'll help you but they don't realize like you they might not understand what your goal is and same when you're like conversing or heading towards like a goal in the conversation I remember I had this collaboration with somebody and he was like man you're really in like the thick of the weeds here you're like in the grass looking I'm not I'm not following you I don't get what any of this has to do with anything and I was like oh well okay let me explain what it has to do with it and he's like, you're just rant like you're I can't follow this you're just ranting and I was like and then I was like trying to figure out how to get it. And I didn't, I don't know how to simplify what I think is a complex issue in a way that like gets that kind of a brain to hear me. So then I'm like, yeah. I don't want to talk to you. And they're like, Brittany's avoiding the conversation. Yeah. She doesn't want to engage. She doesn't know how to like share her ideas. And I'm like, I don't know how to communicate with you. And you don't know how to communicate with me because I feel like I'm being clear and you're not yeah. getting it. And like, I, those people aren't bad. Like you're not bad for not understanding me and I'm not bad for not understanding you. But I think the negative comes in when you think there's a right or wrong in the communication mm -hmm. style that needs to then be yeah. moralized. Yeah. And same with aesthetic. Like you're moralizing yeah. tattoos for no reason. And because you're moralizing tattoos, like just the simplicity of having a tattoo, then it lends, to, then it becomes this whole thing in society that it doesn't need to be. Now I can understand yeah. if you have a specific tattoo I can understand if the tattoo is something like racist or something. Sure, we can moralize the racism, but not the mm. tattoo. Not yeah. the idea that you got a tattoo. Because I was thinking about neurodivergent aesthetics in relation to like rebellious aesthetics like tattoos. Like I don't know very many neurotypical people that have tattoos that aren't religious. So then it's a religious signal that aren't in gangs. So it's a gang affiliation that aren't in like organizations like the military or policemen. So, okay, another signaling to the gang or group. And then... Uh, like religious people, like I said, culturally, so cultural tribes, those people can all be neurotypical. But what if you're not a part of a community like that and you're getting a tattoo? Then it begs the question. Like I've noticed that with my siblings, like the neurodivergent siblings are much more attracted to tattoos than the neurotypical ones. Not that I'm convinced any of my siblings are truly neurotypical, but <laughs> it's like, okay, like there's a draw, but I don't know if the draw is to the rebellion so much as like, that seems pretty. I want to get it. Yeah. And I think there's something there that I find fascinating. Like earlier you said um, you were saying something that made me write down um, cosplayers versus kitty girls versus leather people versus like different groups of people, like adults who play Pokemon, adults who outgrew Pokemon. And I'm going to assume if you still play Pokemon in your 40s, you're maybe neurodivergent, not because I think neurodivergents have kid hobbies, but because I think neurodivergents are more comfortable exploring their imagination. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of neurotypical adults are punished for exploring their imagination and a lot of them stop at some point. 
And that's why I think the greatest artists will talk about like having a child in your heart, keeping a child imagination, being a big kid, because it allows you to like hone in on some part of you that you eventually in society usually have to get rid of to be quote in society. And I think there's something there, but I don't think it's literally every person who is an animator is neurodivergent, Mm -hmm. but I think there could be some overlap. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's tying back to the beginning of this conversation is what's the function of someone's um, aesthetics? Is it for them to express themselves or is it making a statement? Because like you said, with the tattoos, someone getting a tattoo because everyone else is getting a tattoo and that's what's cool is completely different than someone getting it despite probably being negatively judged because they genuinely like the art or they generally like exactly genuinely like the process. Um, And I think that's something I've been thinking about um, before this podcast is what those contingencies are and our relationship to it as neurodivergence. Cause I think for a lot of high masking neurodivergence, it could be very freeing in the beginning of the journey to realize that aesthetics can very much so tie into how others perceive us. And in a way you could control that and feel less helpless. Like if I dressed a certain way, um, I could kind of control the way that people look at me. Or if I look a certain way, I could control the way that people determine my value. But I think as you dive deeper and deeper into that, in more specific contexts and relationships, you realize that it's not as freeing as you think, because when you express, when you use your aesthetics to make a statement like that, yes, in one sense, it, you could follow a guideline, right? So generally speaking, because of how our society is, if you're somewhat fit, if you're somewhat you take care of your hygiene. If you look a certain way, objectively, people automatically think that you take care of yourself better or that you're um, more socially connected or you're more successful and things like that. But once you get into actual, you know, interactions, you realize that people aren't willing to see you outside of what they think what you look like means. So for example, I remember when I first started getting tattoos, something that I've noticed is that depending on who I was interacting with, they passed a lot of judgments in relation to my tattoos that had nothing to do with who I was. So if I was in Asian communities, um, older Asian adults would think that I was really rebellious and um, I was maybe promiscuous and things like that. And if I were, you know, meeting someone for a date, they would think that I was like super kinky and um, I liked pain and things like that Um, or that I was like a freak. And then I'm just like, how do you guys get these sort of, you know, how do you guys draw these conclusions? It's really confusing. Like for me, I just like the art. I like the process. It's that simple. Um, And then take those examples and multiply it times 20, like my hair color, the way that I dress. And then you start to realize I'm not really safe in any sort of aesthetic choice because people are always going to pass judgment. So at some point in my life in college, I would dress pretty to fit into my environment. And then so what that would do, it would signal to neurotypical people that I was one of them. And so groups of neurotypical people or groups of neurotypical women would come to befriend me only to realize that none of who I was was contingent on the way I looked, or I would attract certain people to want to date me, but we wouldn't get along at all because they thought I was like everyone else that they would date. And then I realized uh, way after, but during that time, I'm like, why am I attracting so many people into my life that I don't get along with? And it's because I was using my aesthetics to mask rather than express myself. And so I was attracting people who thought I would be a certain person only to realize I wasn't like that at all. And so I think a big part of, you know, embracing who I authentically am is asking myself, you know, despite what statement I'm going to make in whatever groups of people or whatever relationships, 
who, how do I want to express myself? And sometimes that looks like not even caring what I wear and just prioritizing comfort because I live with a disability and I have chronic pain. So that's what's most important to me. And sometimes that means, you know, honestly, I don't even really dress crazy anymore in any sort of way because it's just I, I don't need to um, in order to feel good. So I don't know. It's just. Yeah, I think that's just an interesting thing is to consistently experience the world being unwilling to understand the nuance of a human outside of the labels. And I think that's tying back to the categorizing thing is it's easy to mistake people like you who categorize as being judgmental and not willing to see people for who they are. But for you, I mean, again, it's different when you're taking in that information, are you willing to take in more information and let the picture draw itself out? Or are you stopping and willfully being ignorant and saying, I don't need this information because it contradicts with how I see you and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, and I would actually, this is my intention. My intention is to categorize you so I see you clearly instead yeah. of the opposite, because I noticed that in my life and especially online, people will miscategorize me. I'm like, no, no, if you're going to judge me, please categorize me correctly because you're judging me on something that's just like not true. And so it confuses me. Like, why would you run with a miscategorization of me? And when you could judge me on what, who, who I really am, which then the criticism is so much more easier to digest. Cause it's like, okay, at least you see me now you can criticize me, but I do not allow any criticism to come into my sphere that miscategorizes me initially. If you miscategorize me, I don't care about your opinion. Like that's the rule, right? And that's the rule I've kept for myself because I know how it feels to be miscategorized. It sucks. Like it doesn't make any sense. Now, going along with the judgment, this is what's interesting because I was thinking about, okay, so I also dress less crazy as I get older. I mostly get to dress up for stream and podcast. That's like my opportunity. But even for my stream, I have my own merch and I made my own merch so I could wear it for stream and I wouldn't have to think about what to wear every day. <laughs> and I was like, how do I make my life more simple? And I just wear the same shirts now for stream and it's so convenient and it's so nice. But I even have, and I just realized this the other day, I was like, oh my God, I have like a uniform I wear when I go grocery shopping. And I wondered if the people at the grocery shop, because I would notice if I was them, are like, this girl wears the same clothes every time she comes to the store. I basically have my outside clothes, my convenient clothes, my comfy clothes, and I basically wear them. Um, I just go with the same because it's quick. It, like I, I don't have to think. I just grab it. I put it on and I go downstairs or whatever. I walk to the street. I walk down the street to the store and boom, 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 boom. It's like, okay, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But then I realize if I saw someone wearing the same thing every day for a few weeks, eventually I'd be like, neurodivergent because like you are too comfortable in that sweater and in high school my cousin had this sweater that I loved and I was like can I wear this sweater at school and she's like sure I wore it every day for a very long time and eventually the kids were like hey you wear the same thing every day are you okay and I was like it's comfortable and it feels good and I feel attractive in it and I feel comfortable in it and I just feel like it like I love this sweater and I didn't think that it was weird that I was wearing the same exact clothes to school every day because underneath the sweater was a shirt that I just changed. So in my head, I was like changing the part that mattered, which is the part that would make me smell. But outside is what's being perceived. So then people were perceiving me as somebody who like is uh, doesn't have money or doesn't have clothes or like is maybe like kind of crazy because she's wearing the same mm -hmm. clothes every day. I was just comfortable. Mm -hmm. I was just comfortable, but gender also plays a role in this. Do you remember the experiment that news anchor did where he wore the same suit every day for like a year and no one noticed, but if the mm -mm. women wear the same clothes, even twice a week, people will write emails into the station. Interesting. Yeah. That's like, so that's the problem that also plays a role is like gender perception is playing a role. So then your perceived gender either allows you to signal different things aesthetically that other people perceive differently. So I know like that's, that's the problem is like, none of these things are simple. All of it is like, who's perceiving it? What's the context? Who's the bubble? What's the expectation of behavior? And how do these things translate? Like here in Croatia, where I live now, sweatpants are like PJs. 
but sports as like us uh athleisure athleisure is very common and very good but it's mostly not sweatpants most people who wear athleisure here i notice are wearing like um like a shinier smoother uh maybe a nylon i don't know what the the material is but it's not like cotton sweats mm -hmm. so even when i wear my cotton sweats i am signaling like foreigner which is interesting and i think people know my partner says it's like the way i walk feels like a foreigner and i'm like even the way i walk so now i'm like i'm even paying attention to how i walk and i'm like i'm o i'm over it i'm not gonna worry about it too much it doesn't matter they're very nice to me people have been very nice to me here but even that even that tells people like oh you're not from here which is interesting mm -hmm. and i'm not looking to assimilate that hard so it's okay but i i i'm doing my best to do it within in a way that makes sense right like yeah. learning the customs and learning the expectations of behavior but yeah yeah that's the thing is ideally people will get to the point where they take in information in a way where they use it to understand the person more rather than wanting to immediately pass judgment and apply it to themselves in a way where at the end of the day you just do whatever you need to do despite what people are going to think and i feel like something that i've noticed is because i'm not extremely judgmental and that's not the main reason why i process the world there's certain people in my life that will get upset with me because they say i'm too nice or i'm too idealistic or i'm naive um like i give people the benefit of the doubt all the time because people whenever they try to talk to me about like sharing opinions they'll say what do you think about this um like for example someone asked me, what do you think about um, the state of our politics or whatever in the US? And then I'm just, again, like that general question like yeah. you brought up earlier. And I'm just like, well, why are you asking that question? What are you looking for? Because exactly. like, I don't have enough information in my mind to feel comfortable passing a judgment and giving you a definitive opinion. All I could say generally is that it's shit and there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen. Um, and then they get upset because they're like looking for a specific answer to see where am I in terms of how close is my opinion to theirs. Yeah. And they're trying to determine if I'm safe or not. Yeah. And it's just interesting because it's like, regardless of if we agree or not, we should be safe to each other. You know, we should be able to still understand and listen to each other. But I feel like society makes things so contingent on each other of like the only way you could listen to someone is if they agree with you if not then you don't listen and you're defensive and it's just so messed up i want to see like these types of things get pulled apart from each other as the years go on um and this happens all the time what do you think about this person and i'm just like i don't know enough information about them all i know is these two things that's it and i can't even pass judgment on why they do it because I need other information to figure that out. Even then, I don't even know if I want to pass judgment at that point because why? Why do I have to do that? Um, all I could do is understand them in a deeper level, but you know, outside of that, like what are you looking for? Why do you right. need me to tell you like how I see this person and, and the worth of this person and things like that? Um, and I think it's I think that's what sometimes gets people to misunderstand me in my videos is I process topics and people conceptually and, and not in a judgmental way. But I think, especially in that aesthetics video I made, I think people thought it was in a judgmental way when I was just exploring a concept. And so people got so lost in the details of, well, blue hair people could be mean too, and you're typical. And I'm just like, you guys are missing the point completely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I, and I look, I under, same. I mean, the same thing happens to me. It's a content creation. <laughs> this is like the part about content creation that's so like frustrating because you're, you know yourself, you know your heart, you know your intentions. And then for people not to give you that benefit of the doubt and the way I give people the benefit of the doubt, I've also been called naive. And I've also been like uh, called pe people are like, oh my God, Brittany, you're too optimistic about people. 
I am optimistic about people because I feel like with the right tools, all people have the potential to just be wonderful. And I think it's a combination of like so many things that play a factor in people not being so wonderful. But I know my intentions and I think most people have good intentions, even if it's not expressed in the best way. I actually think the people that were mad in your comment sections that are always mad at mine, I think they're also expressing some anger and fear out of good intentions. I think they're also trying to say, I feel hurt by this. The problem is, is that like content creators can't do emotional labor for you. Like at the end of the day, if you're upset over something someone said that differs from your opinion, you might want to talk to a therapist or you can express it in a way that says, hey, like I really appreciate the video. This is where I disagree with you. Like I can always tell the people who are just disagreeing because it's an ideas idea and people who feel genuinely hurt. And then sometimes I'll make a correction and the people that feel hurt will be like, okay, maybe I was just feeling hurt. Thank you for clarifying. I think I just took offense to it. Like they can't hear it. Like I will say a disclaimer in the beginning of a video. I will say it in the first two minutes of the video. And then people will be like, they'll say something. And I'm like, timestamp it. I'm like, hey girl, I said this in the very beginning. Maybe you missed it. No problem. Here it is again. And they'll realize like, oh, I wasn't even listening to this person. So this is a practice I do for myself is if I hear a content creator and I get upset with something they say, I like listen to it again the next day to see if I was upset in that moment because I'm having like a biological experience, a mental health problem, something else, or if I'm actually just disagreeing and I'm actually upset because it's really easy to get upset very quickly over a lot. Like there's a lot of reasons your body or your brain might be like, oh, I don't like this. So maybe I'm just overstimulated. Yeah. Maybe it's the same thing with getting triggered or having like an autistic yeah. meltdown. Like it's so easy to judge it, but if you know what's happening, it's like not even that big of a deal in a sense where you have to make it a big deal. Not the person having the meltdown, but the person observing it. Like sometimes I've noticed that with mental health people, they'll be having like a triggered moment and people around them will be scared. And I'm like, oh, you're miscategorizing it. This person's not going to hurt you. This person's going to hurt themselves. Like mm -hmm. this person isn't even going to hurt you, girl. This person is going to hurt themselves. So we need to help them. It's like, you remember there was a, this was years ago. There was a, um, I think I forgot what he had, but he had a disability of some kind and he had been triggered. And this patient went out into the middle of the road and his caretaker was trying to calm him down. And a police officer pointed a gun at them thinking they were something. I was like, you're miscategorizing the situation. Like you're misperceiving the comfort, like the situation. This is a situation where you need your help, not your guns. And it's that, that I would love for people to stop doing. And so when I categorize, I'm genuinely trying to harm reduce. I'm trying to make sure that I'm not being judgmental by not assuming like this first observation, I'm trying to be like, okay, what category do you fall into? And, you know, not everybody who votes for Trump is a horrible person, but maybe, you know, all the horrible people are voting for Trump. Maybe, maybe, but I don't know, you know? So maybe when I observe a person, I have to say, okay, my intuition is like, I don't like this, but let me deconstruct it because I know a lot of really good people voting for Trump. Their intentions are good, even if it's not maybe the decision I'm going to make. You know what I mean? It's like, OK, how do I deconstruct this? How do I say to myself, not everybody who fits in this category is necessarily bad, but which category of voter are they? Because, this, you know what I'm saying? Like there's some like. Trump was endorsed by the KKK. I feel like, okay, I want to make sure you're not the KKK, but maybe you're just like a Christian Baptist in the Midwest who really is pro-life. Okay. Like these two things are different, even if you're voting for the same candidate. So I think that that is actually helping against prejudice and bias. But I also, and this is probably the difference between a lot of people in my group of people, my category of person, I actually think everybody suffers from bias and prejudice. I don't think you can escape it. I think it's a biological experience. I think it's a human experience. I think it's a universal experience. And then your relationship yeah. with it is dependent. And then who your bias or prejudice against is dependent on who you are as a person. I meet a lot of people who go, I'm not bias or prejudice. Um, are you sure about that? Because I've heard you talk about people and I know that that's your bias and prejudice playing a role in that conversation. And for people who don't think they're bias or prejudice, then they would become the people that I think would almost be the most afraid of being judged in a sense because they're almost like denying the fact that they could have fault. And I just think all of us are imperfect beings. So genuinely with all of my heart, I am never trying to demoralize a person by categorizing them. I'm only trying to be kind and compassionate through categorization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like whenever you're categorizing people, you're just finding the function behind something. Um, the why? Like, 
Yeah, the why behind something. Sorry, this is my stim thing. It's like a baguette, but it's foam. Stop. So I'm I just looking for squeezing. something. I tear up my nails when I'm doing these types of things and on straight and I just ruined my whole like progress of my nails. I need something. I don't know what to get though, because my fibro makes my hands really ache. So if I'm oh yeah, if I'm doing this too much, then I'm just wearing out my body as it is. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what can I get that I can scratch and pick at without ruining. <laughs> I just tear up tissue. Well, this is super soft. Oh, very cool. It's not like those stress balls where it's actually a lot of tension in it. So this is super soft. So I've just kind of been like, you know, I might need to get something like that. What, what would I even Google to find something like that? Honestly, this is those little, um, when you're typing on your keyboard, you rest your wrist oh, on it. Oh, really? So I, I got this rest. off Amazon. Okay. Just like little silly things like this. But oh, I will This helps me it process out. better. Just, yeah, I'm yeah. always, you know, stimming. Yeah, I love but that. Okay. This is why I like the way that you process because it's really rare to find people that can, let's just use like, um, controversial things as an example, because it's easier to understand this concept through controversy. So I feel like the way that people process is so divisive and black and white, ironically. Yeah. I, nowadays. Girl, don't even get me started. The way they accuse my BPD, uh, like neurodivergent brain as being black and white, when I'm trying to be so much more gray than the rest of these people, don't even get me yeah. started. Like, there's so many different black and white conversations that I see going on right now. For example, one I saw the other day is um, someone saying on TikTok, just a reminder, if there's someone you know in your life that claims to love you but votes for a candidate that takes away your rights, right. then they don't actually love you and right. you need to cut them out of your life. And I was just like, this is not – like I see what you're saying and it's so valid, but this is not where we have – like where we need to go. Um, and then – now tying back to the whole Trump thing, like there's so many different types of people that support Trump. Sure. Like there's people that support him. There's immigrants that support him, not necessarily out of pride, but it's more so out of like fear. Mm. Right. And then a, an immigrant supporting Trump or a conservative supporting Trump is completely different than let's say a white supremacist supporting sure. Trump. For and sure. they're supporting him Aren't out of parents immigrants. My parents are immigrants and voting for Trump. You don't have to share your parents perspective. I don't want to bring them into it, but my parents are Trumpers. And so they're voting Trump. They feel like he, they are afraid. They are actually, they, they go, we escaped our former country to exactly. come here and you're ruining America by voting Kamala. And I was like, too late girl. I already voted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of immigrant, um, parents of, of like that generation that yep. are genuinely afraid because they escaped their country more or less, or they're afraid of communism. And it, it's like genuine fear. It, it has nothing to do with pride or right. hate or racism. It's like the fear of like politics and the government and communism, and they are voting for Trump. And that is completely different than someone who's a white supremacist that's voting for him because of their pride and hatred for, um, people of color and things like that. And it's just, it's important to learn why someone has their beliefs because you cannot just see that someone's a Trump supporter and be like, I don't care why you, you support him. I just think you're a bad person and you hate all gay people and um, all this kind of stuff. And then you start to list off all the contingencies of what a Trump supporter is. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how that ties to the other stuff I want to share. Okay, well, hold on. You want to talk about aesthetic of, uh, um, do you know um, I'm autistic now what? I've seen her videos every now and then, but I don't watch her religiously. Okay, me, I try not to there. watch other autistic creators because I don't want to um, unintentionally emulate or say the same sure. things. Totally. Yeah. I totally, I watch her videos on occasion and usually like sometimes she's really got bangers and she just made a really good one on talking about how like being autistic doesn't mean you're left wing. Okay. And there are a lot of neurodivergent people that are MAGA, a lot of neurodivergent people that are conservative. I mean, gosh, most of the misogynists on the internet that hate me, definitely autistic. And a part of it is like their sense of justice is coming out and they're like, I hate Britney. Britney is a threat to the thing that I love. And I'm just sitting here like, relax, bro, like relax, you're looping. But I do think that 
neurodivergency exists in all facets of life. And some of the, like, that's why, you know, guys, some of those homophobic, homophobic people I know are gay. And so it's like the irony is like that internalized homophobia that like the irony is that they have a reason their brain got them there for a reason. And look, my parents, homophobic and transphobic. So they are the typical expectation of a Trump voter in that way. But the thing about them that is most, um, I think, you know, like misunderstood is that they are first and foremost afraid for this country. They are so afraid for America in the same way that we feel as queer people or I feel as queer people is like, I'm afraid that we're not going to have the civil rights we need to like have a life worth living in America as women, as people who have babies, as people who need abortions, whatever. So the same thing is operating, but I want to make sure that I'm not operating on fear and allowing my prejudice and bias to discriminate against people that are different from me, even if I perceive them as people that maybe um, whose ideas I, I hope aren't coming into our future. Like, I hope that homophobic ideas aren't something that exists in the future, even though I know it will. And so that doesn't mean I want to, like, do anything negative to the people who are voting this way. If anything, I I, I think I take a very radical loving stance which is like everyone deserves health care even homophobes everybody deserves kindness even homophobes like everybody deserves dignity in life even homophobes and i have that stance because it's actually a part of my values right mm -hmm. it's a part of my values i don't think people recognize that when they look at a person and they judge them on the aesthetic and voting is an aesthetic as well right i'll get into this in a moment that they are allowing their bias and prejudice to play a role Ironically enough, have you been seeing the trucks, the pickup trucks with the American flag and then the presidential candidate flag? And everyone's like, oh, my God, it's a Trump truck. And then it ends up being a Harris truck. No, I haven't seen that. Oh, my God. I'm in love because the comments are like, I'm so damaged that I'm so used to that being a Trump voter thing that I wasn't prepared for it to be a Kamala thing. But what it is, is it's allowing you to recognize your prejudice and the thing that you've been built up because society ha has built that up in your head that trucks with flags equal Trump. But just a mm -hmm. reminder, like Democrats have a truck too, liberals drive trucks too, like lots of people have trucks, a lot of conservatives are voting for Kamala this time around. Like 200 Republicans uh, in government are like voting for Kamala this time around. Like uh, people are coming out left and right voting for Harris this time around. So realistically, this is an opportunity for us to remember that. And Kamala said it the best in her last speech the other day. She is going to be the president for all Americans, even the ones that didn't vote for her. And that's mm -hmm. the point is like, if we want to move forward, we have to move forward by recognizing that our prejudice and bias exists in all of us and how we judge people on aesthetic, how they, how they are, how we perceive them, how they perceive us. Like this can either go negative or positive. And that includes when I judge people for looking like they didn't brush their teeth today. Again, I'm trying, just trying to say, why are you getting away with this? But also I know hygiene is so hard. I do. As somebody who like won't brush your teeth and lets us her special toothpaste, I absolutely understand that being hygienic is like a whole journey. Um, I always tell my partner, we have to have haircuts that are like easy to maintain because non-easy maintaining haircuts is too much. But okay. Have you ever heard of like the Nazi haircut? Do you know no. it's like really it's when guys have really buzzed heads and then hair on top and every guy who has that haircut who wasn't like a Nazi had to get rid of it like Macklemore the rapper because people were calling his haircut the Nazi haircut. Isn't that just like a European guy thing like okay, so, British guys? Sure, but it got co-opted. And so because Richard Spencer and all these kind of Nazi guys on the internet started doing their hair like that, now everyone's like Nazi haircut. And so that changes culture too. And there is like a neurodivergent style of being when I see girls, especially goth girls, not all goth girls, but specific goth girls. I'm like bisexual autistic right there. That's a bisexual autistic girl. And it's a very specific look. And then, okay, this is like the irony. Now that I know her aesthetic, do I know her politics? Absolutely not. That could be a Trump voter. That could be anything. That could be a homophobe. That could be an internalized homophobe, bisexual girl. I don't know nothing about her. But what I do know is this is an opportunity to figure out the nuances of that person, regardless of what their aesthetic is signaling, or maybe my misperception of what their aesthetic is signaling. Because that's the other thing too. Like, oh, I don't know if your family is like this. I was just talking to my partner about this. We're Middle Eastern. And being groomed is like very important. And if you came to my parents' house ungroomed, that would be like, it kind of disrespectful. Like you're meeting people for the first time. You didn't come groomed. Like, what are you doing? And 
I one time I had a friend visit and they came ungroomed and I was like, why didn't you groom yourself before meeting my family? And they were like, why? It's just your family. Why do I have to impress them? And I was like, well, it's kind of, it, it signals in my culture, like kind of, you're being kind of disrespectful. You're like kind of saying, I don't need to be my best here. You're not worth it to me, which they kind of said, right? Like you just said, like, why do I need to do this for your family? You're basically saying, serve me food, welcome me into your home, but I'm not going to like get a haircut or dress nicely, which is like very interesting, which is also, I think where my, Ooh, I just had an epiphany. Maybe that's my prejudice of guys showing up to interviews looking like they just rolled out of bed. Maybe it signals to the person like you're not even worth dressing up for your show, your podcast, the effort you put into your aesthetic. You're not worth it to me. Oh, maybe I see it as like a form of entitlement. Oh, ooh, that's I'm having an epiphany. Yeah, maybe mm. that's what I see. But then as I watch the interview, I realize like, oh, he's just disabled, bro. <laughs> mm. But hey, disabled people can look good, too. Mm -hmm. OK, but yeah, maybe that's what it is. Maybe I think it's like a form of entitlement. Oh, I'm having an epiphany real time. I mm. think another part of it could also be the need to be oppositional or subverse, subver subversive of people's expectations. So I've noticed, I've met people in my life where they don't, they're so committed to not fit into a stereotype that it's almost like they observe every person in their stereotype and they go out of their way to subvert it. And it's to a point where for example, let's say someone is going to an interview and they want to send the message of, I could have bad hygiene and dress up um, and not care about what I wear and still be a really great employee with very good work ethic and whatever. And I want them to know that because I want them to understand that they're not synonymous. And so they purposefully go into the interview like that. Or let's say they purposefully go to your parents' house um, not caring about their hygiene or what they wear, but they're wanting to show I could still be respectful and engaged um, and likable without that part. Um, and then there's an, a flavor of that that's different of I want to subvert your expectations because I don't want you to think that you have control over my choices. Yeah. Like, I don't want you to think that um, I'm going to change what I do to purposefully appease you and things like that. And I feel like, I feel like that is, could be so tiring when people are like that. Oh my God. It's, yeah. It's almost like being too self-aware and you have to ask yourself, what would you actually choose if you didn't have to think about sending a message to another person yeah. and subvert your expectations or whatever it is. Like sometimes you just want to be clean and it doesn't matter if someone's going to judge you good or bad because of it. Sometimes you just want to be nice and respectful and it's not because you're, you're trying to appease someone and things like that. And, you know, I feel like sometimes that's such a pitfall that some neurodivergence could fall into is almost learning the patterns of society too much where we become too self-aware and there's almost this responsibility over every single choice we make and make we have this expectation of ourselves to make sure that every choice is perfect in our minds so that we're not because I think about one person specifically in my life she's autistic and ADHD it's like she cannot have any human interaction without thinking about what her choices are going to look like to them and then therefore changing the way she would actually respond because she doesn't want the other person to think that just because she does one thing, it means that she's listening to them or is giving into that person. Like she wants to send them the message that I am autonomous. And this kind of goes into the pervasive drive for autonomy, the PDA concept of yep. like, mm -hmm. I want people to know that I'm in control of my own actions. I'm autonomous. But then that ironically leads you to be almost controlled by things much more because yes. you can't even just do what you want to do anymore because you're constantly thinking to yourself, how is this going to be perceived by others? And how can I intentionally send the message that they can't control me? 
And, but that controls your actions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I wrote, I wrote down fake freedom, PDA. And I wrote down when you actually dress nice, you know, and your parents are like, oh, I'm so glad you listened to me. And it's like, <sighs> yeah, I'm going to take it off. I'm going to take it off, bro. It's like, don't tell me what to do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like that's no, I, that's why I always ask people like, okay, like you're by yourself on an island. What do you want to do? Like, what would you do if you were alone in your apartment and the rest of the world wasn't here? Like, what's something you really want to do that makes sense? So I even made a podcast about this the other day. Like, I really live, I do every I do what I want every day, but within reason. I do everything I want to do every day, but I'm disabled. I do everything I want to do every day, but I've limited spoons. I do everything I want to do every day within reason I still have to pay rent. Like, Obviously, but I, I really do try to move my life in a way that allows me to feel like I'm so excited to be awake. I'm busy every minute of every day doing everything I want to do, which is so exciting, even if that includes relaxing. Got to schedule in a relaxing time, which I'm learning how to do. You know, everything I do is what I want to do, but how do I get there? I do try to listen to myself because I always tell my, I always tell the internet, do not tempt me. I will delete my channel. Do I don't tell me what to do. I will delete YouTube right now. Like, and they're like, oh, Brittany's PDA is showing. And it's like a big joke, but it's kind of a real sensation I get in my body where I'm like, ooh, are you telling me what to do, girl? Are you telling me what to do? Now, I will say that, hold on, wait, wait. Parents, fake freedom, PDA, living for other people. Oh, I lost my train of thought. Wait, audit ADHD, always asking like, what would they do? Damn it. Do you have any thoughts? I blanked. This reminds me of the conversation on TikTok about mm. should cashiers or waiters, or no, should people in the food industry um, say hello to you? And do they oh. have to have small talk with you or have conversation with you? Because one, one guy was like, you guys talk about wanting to be in a community, but you guys won't even say hi to customers anymore or have small talk. And you treat us like... Um, like we're bothering you even though you're at a job. Totally. And then a lot of neurodivergent people are responding to that and pushing back on that saying, you don't understand like how much society expects from each other. And for neurodivergence, it's, it's like very unnatural for us. And we're constantly giving in these situations. Um, and it's so exhausting. And then it's so interesting because it, it really is such a divided conversation because there's a lot of therapists that are responding to the neurodivergence and pushing back on them and saying, you guys, even though everything is valid, like this is what it takes to be in community. Yes. Like you have to be able to accommodate each other and be respectful. And, and we don't get to just be hyper individualistic and think to ourselves, like people don't deserve this time or um, respect and things like that. And get to the point where we're not even saying hi to the fellow human and whatever. Yeah. And it's so interesting because every time I see these different point of views, I'm like, I understand what everyone's saying, but why is it so divided? Like, what are we actually talking about? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think people, okay. So this is what I think it might be, but I could be wrong. I think people want it to be comfortable all the time. And I think that in order to be a part of a community, we have to be uncomfortable some of the time. So the way that I explain it to like my conservative parents is like, I know you're uncomfortable seeing gay people, but I need you to understand you live in America and it's about being free and you have to learn to be comfortable with people being different from you. And they'll say, but why do I have to see it? Why do they have to push it into my face? I was like, be because in the same way that I have to sit here and watch you guys sometimes pray the rosary in public or pray at restaurants and it's a little uncomfortable for people, it's also something we understand is just a part of your culture and your religion. And people are willing to make room for that. People are willing to, you know, make space for you. And so we're just asking you to do the same. But I think it's hard for people to imagine that making space doesn't also include condoning behavior. And I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. America is so diverse. And to live in a diverse world, we have to sort of be uncomfortable together sometimes. But I think that's why we should find our communities, harm reduce, make sure freedom is the forefront of our belief in America, at least to speak for that country. And then 
to focus on being a little uncomfortable sometimes. And that's why I say like pick a bubble and then know what you're doing in each bubble when you're socializing. Because I put on like my, and I know transitions are hard. I put on like my little socializing hat and I'm like, I'm going to socialize. And I understand things go wrong, plans change, and all of a sudden you're, dere- you know, dysregulated because you didn't plan for this and now everything's kind of a mess. But realistically, like sometimes we'll just have to be uncomfortable. And that's life itself. Like life itself is kind of an uncomfortable experience. But I think you can take comfort in being uncomfortable and knowing that that is a universal experience. Like everybody feels it. You are not alone. You are not special in this. And you should take comfort in that because we can make life, I think, a lot easier for one another when we recognize that, hey, everyone's uncomfortable. So maybe in this situation, I can try to comfort this person who might be uncomfortable, or maybe somebody can do that for you. I think there's an illusion that neurotypical people aren't anxious, don't think about social scripts, aren't concerned about their own, um, you know, actions or aren't double thinking themselves or, you know, don't also need some sort of uh, accommodation. I just think their accommodations look different. And I think we humans, and I get this, I think they tend to be bitter and forget that everybody needs an accommodation. It just might look different. And I think that that's what's difficult about being a part of a community is at the end of the day, even in the most progressive, wonderful, inclusive communities, there will be a standard of aesthetic expression, opinion. And if you don't adhere to one of the expectations, you might be ostracized. And there's, you know, in some ways, that's exactly how society should work. And in other ways, that's exactly the problem with society. Mm-hmm. And now we have to contend with that, that catch 22. Yeah. I feel like something that I always like to say is I don't think near typicals don't struggle or don't go through the same things as us. It's just, I feel like neurodivergence and autistic folks go through it at a more sensitive capacity. So it's like f- the struggle times four. Um, or the solutions I think don't work. So neurotypicals will be like, here's the solution. Just get up and work. And I'm like, that is not yeah. helpful. Yeah. And so that's the dilemma too, right? It's like, not only is it five times harder in some ways, but the solutions are completely different. Yeah. And what's interesting is I feel like autistic folks are being used sociologically as the signalers of what disease is in a society. So in a sense, I feel like those solutions also in a way doesn't work for neurotypicals, but because of how they think and the way that they're able to more easily fit into the neurotypical society, the solution, even though isn't great for them either, it is more easily utilized by them. So it's easier for them to fit into it. So I guess a metaphor for that is, um, let's see using um horse shampoo for <laughs> like to 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 wash their hair um oh no that's a bad metaphor let me think what's something that they could use where it's better for them but it's not as useful for us like a just do it attitude maybe like just push through just like do it no matter what like or what's a good one give mm. me a second let yeah, me yeah. think of a metaphor got this. I believe in you. This is stupid, but I'm just thinking about like the oil that you use to like lube up your bike chain so that it runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. And then let's say we all have to metaphorically use a bike to get around and we need our bikes to run smoothly. Um, That solution is like getting that bike chain lube and making sure you maintain your bike chains. But you know, Autistic folks or neurodivergent folks, we don't have bikes. Uh, We have rollerblades. And Mm. it's like they're giving us that bike lube and they're like, use this. It'll help you, you know, maintain things better and you could get around better. And it's just like, thanks, but this isn't really going to work with what I have. So I'm still going to struggle getting around more than you. Like you could have a bike and it works perfectly. You get from point A to point B better because the system is made for bikes. But Um, like I can try to use this bike lube and try to lube up the wheels on my roller skates, but it's not really going to work the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Wait, can I expand on that? I almost thought like, okay, what if you have like, 
only gravel roads with lots of rocks and pebbles and you have rollerblades and they have bicycles and they're like, oh, here's some mountain bike tires that will really help. And I'm like, well, they don't fit on my rollerblades. And they're like, oh, just yeah. get a bike. And it's like, I can't get a bike. Like it doesn't work. Like I won't, I won't be able to use the bike even if I had one. They're like, why not? Everyone can use a bike. And I was like, no, not everyone can use the bike. So it's kind of like, you're giving me a tool that doesn't make sense. But from the outside, since we're all people, they're like, well, you're a person and I'm a person and it works for me. So it should work for you. And I'm like, I love that math. The math is almost good, but the math is wrong. Yeah. And my philosophy in general about neurodivergence is how can we find different ways to get the job done, but it also works for us. And what are those solutions that would also work for us? What are the tools yes. that would also work for us? So yes. if if we all had to get around from point A to B, how can neurodivergent folks still get that done? It's not used as, as an excuse to not, it's just we need different tools and we yes. have to figure out what those tools are instead of going the next many years thinking about how we could get the bike when it's not possible. Like exactly. what else can we explore here? You know? Yes. Well, I think the perk of getting the bike is now you're one of them, but the truth is like, you're, you're, we're all one of each other. We're all people, but you're not having the same experience. And I do think that I, again, because I categorize people, it allows me to say, how does your brain work? What works for your brain? What's good for your brain? And this really helped me in my life. Like, I don't think I could have understood you know, when people say like, oh, it's all in your head. I'm like, correct. But you mean it to say that it doesn't exist. And I mean it to say literally everything is in our brains. We are having perception differences and I'm not bad for having my way of perceiving things. I, I'm, I'm just going to have a unique, like a different way, a shared way with many people of just recontextualizing things in a different way to come up with a better solution for my particular brain. And that's why like, it is difficult because like you meet one autistic person, you're not, you're meeting one autistic person. You meet one borderline person, you're meeting one borderline person. Like what works for me and it might not work for you. I even try to preface this in my videos all the time. Like this might not work for you. And I do dislike when people are like, so what are your solutions, Brittany? Okay, girl, just because I notice a problem doesn't mean I understand the solution. I only understand what works for me. But the idea is that if we share and we share, we share, maybe someone will hear us. Maybe someone listening to this podcast will be like, oh, ding, ding, ding. I just got that thing that I was thinking about. I just hit me in a way. Now I can problem solve my issue. But when you grow up in a world where they think one size fits all, you're growing up with a world that's limited even for neurotypical people. When has it ever been beneficial that every, like a one shoe fits all? Like, like when has that ever been beneficial for anybody, neurotypical or neurodivergent? So Again, when we're categorizing it, categorizing people, we're doing it to find your strengths, not to ignore you or make erase you, not to, you know, objectify you, but to actually like really see you. But again, I think it's unsafe. I noticed that in the online spaces that I've definitely like visited and like didn't fit into, a lot of them punish you for a diagnosis. Oh, you're autistic. That's why you're fucked up in this conversation. You just don't get what's going on. No, no. No, 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 that's not what's, that's not correct. But their categorization also comes with the judgment. But the irony is like, they also run into the bubbles where they've internalized ableism. So they're like, well, mine doesn't do that. I'm not like that and I have ADHD. I don't know why you can't do it if I can do it and I have ADHD. And I'm like, mm, see what's happening here? You're assuming all ADHD brains are the same or you're saying the neg I don't have that negative. I just go, oh, okay, cool. You're autistic. What does that mean for you? Oh, cool. You're ADHD. What does that mean for you? And then we try to figure it out. I think people also don't think it's efficient in a society to have customizable solutions. And I would argue that's actually what's missing from society is yeah. that we don't have enough. Yeah. I feel like judgment is ultimately the avoidance of your own emotional labor because you're constantly displacing it on other people and situations as what's causing you the dysregulation rather than using it as a signifier to show you what is it inside of you that is, is hurting and trying to speak to you and trying to figure out, okay, how do I actually tune into that and understand it even more? Because if people actually, every time they were triggered and activated, instead of jumping straight into passing judgment onto another person and being defensive or accusatory, 
if they actually introspected, they would realize that there's a lot more nuance in other people and in the world, and there's no use for judgment. And there's more use in understanding yourself and others more. Um, but I feel like, again, our society doesn't encourage nuance. And so therefore it doesn't encourage introspection. And so therefore it's actually better for people's survival to be judgmental and avoid introspection. And I think that's the issue because it's, it's all, it all ties in together. You know, you said that we would benefit from more solutions and more variety, but that that's not necessarily interworked into how all of our main systems work true, at true. all. True. I think in some ways it would actually, it could be a negative, right? It is for sure. Yeah, it's harmful. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could see that for sure. And I think that is the, the problem with, um, that's why I think my work does focus on the individual in a society, meaning like I, I'm not much of a community person, though I'm a good community member. And I think these are very important things, right? I do. I'm very good in isolation. I'm very good in my own space. I'm very good. Like I do not, you know, I pay my taxes. I do not litter. And I say hi to my neighbors, but like, I don't go to monthly meetings in the neighborhood. I used to, I used to try to be a community member. I used to volunteer. I used to clean up streets. I used to be an activist. I used to be very social. And I just felt like, they, the, this wasn't a space for me as an individual to thrive. It was a space for society to maintain a status quo or to change in ways that weren't sufficient for my own fulfillment. So I was like, okay, how do I stay fulfilled and how do I help my community? And honestly, being a streamer kind of helps me in both ways. I don't have to leave my house, but I get to talk to my community. I get to have a community. Like I love one of the comments I get from my audience is like, oh my God, like Brittany is like this space, Brittany's space is a place I get to go into where I get to find myself and get to know myself. My discord was just posting about how like Brittany's ruined my dating life. Now that I'm dating and I'm asking all these questions, I'm like, no one's getting to a second date and I'm laughing. But like, that was an experience I was having where I was like, I am, I'm like my, my now husband says like, oh, when I went on a date with them that it was like an interrogation. And I was like, welcome. And they're like, yeah, but that's kind of like what I liked about you. And every person I've dated before that said the same thing, like, oh my God, you date, your dating style is like an interrogation. And it's like, I'm just asking you about yourself. What do you know about that? What do you think about the universe? What do you, what's your favorite color? Why do you like this anime? Well, why do you identify with this character? It's not an interrogation. I'm trying to get to know you, girl. Like, but it is an interrogation, I guess. But that's the thing though. It's only seen as an interrogation if they think you're passing judgment everything circles back to that. Like, yeah. how are you judging me? And I feel uncomfortable with that. Now, to be fair though, even if, yeah. okay, so let's say the date doesn't end in a second date. They're like, see, if you didn't ask me those questions on the first date, we would have gone to a second date. But then the irony is like, do you want to get married or not? Cause I don't want to settle. So the irony is like, I'm not breaking up with you because I'm judging you. I'm breaking up with you to free you from being married to somebody who will look at you like this every day. But that's the thing <laughs> is, people don't understand that just because you're not the same doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Exactly. Again, it circles back to judgment. Just because you identify we're not compatible doesn't mean you're saying they're a bad person and you're exactly. a good person. It just means we're both good people and we're not good together. That's it. Yes. And again, everything goes back to judgment. People have such an uncomfortable relationship with just being different from each other and nuance. And it's, why do people have such a hard time conceptualizing that everyone is different and contradictory of each other and themselves? And it doesn't have to equal good or bad. Well, obviously, like, and like, that's the problem that like, okay, I think you have to have a very safe space where this conversation is had. And I don't think the world is like a safe space. No, you know, and not to quote Trisha Paytas, but she did say on a podcast recently when, um, did you see soul boom? <laughs> And he asked her, like, can you talk about your time on the internet that was controversial for you? She goes, um, I'm not sure, like, this is, like, a safe space. He's like, it is a safe space. She goes, this might be a safe space, but I don't know if the internet is a safe space. And I'm like, it is not. Like, it is not a safe space. The internet, I think, if you're lucky, I consider my community a pretty safe space. Not for everybody. But for the people that feel they're similarly brained or they feel similarly in vibes, like, this is a great space for a certain level of diversity, right? A certain level, but it still needs to 
sort of not be a safe space for everybody because it doesn't seem possible to do that. Now, just because we're not safe with each other doesn't mean we can't build a safe society together. And I think that's too hard for people to recognize because people make prescriptions. Like one of the biggest criticisms I get on my channel, they're like, Brittany's so judgmental, but she doesn't make enough prescriptions. I'm like, make a decision. Do you want me to be more judgmental? Like, you ought to do this. You should do this. Like good people do this and bad people, like telling people what to do basically. And I don't want to tell you what to do. You do whatever you want. This is what I think would harm reduce, but I don't want to make a prescription. I don't want to say this is, you have to have babies. People who are good have babies. Like, I don't believe that, but I also don't want to, I don't want people to feel like they have to do anything. I want people to come to a realization on their own of what is their joy. What is the thing that makes them feel good about themselves? What are the clothes that make them feel good? What's the aesthetic that makes them feel good? How much do they share? Like I share so much on the internet about my health journeys, about my neurodivergency, about my everything that I have to even remind my audience and myself like, hey guys, I might not tell you everything because I don't owe that to the internet. But also when I share, I'm sharing out of a joy of discovery and hopes that you will also find joy out of your own discovery of self. And I think discovery Mm -hmm. of self is really scary for people because they would have to deconstruct that, that, um, that, uh, construct that they created and were dependent on. And I also think everything is a construct. Like I think everything from words to gender to like religion, like everything is built and we give it meaning and to deconstruct that meaning can be very scary for people because it means like, who am I if it's not this meaning? And I think that's scary, which is why it does scare people to be judged for their aesthetic. It scares people to be boxed in because judgment can lead to really horrifying situations. We really do horrible things to people out of judgment. Yeah. Well, to find yourself is to almost agree to be an outlier. And I feel like based off of survival instincts, humans don't want to do that. Yeah. And I feel like more than anyone else, you know, near typical people have a really strong sense of needing dependency on surviving um, because they can more or less benefit from surviving off the of off of those systems. Whereas, you know, it's still harmful to neurodivergence, but it's almost like more or less depending on your disability and and what it looks like, what your spectrum looks like, even if you wanted to, you can't really survive the same ways. It's not even a matter of choice anymore is the thing is like you, despite trying, can't fit in and be a part of the system. And so therefore you have to almost forcibly find other ways to try to make things work. And the ugly truth is sometimes we don't really. And, and that's what kind of defines the disability. But um, regardless, I don't know how any of this ties into aesthetics. Did we even talk Everything much ties about into aesthetic? I know that, but I'm just signaling. like, yeah, I'm just like, did we even talk about anything that has to do with like what you wear and whatever? You know, we're throwing things to the wind, but I think it's aesthetic is everything from like um, your house, your countertops, your like how often you just how you express yourself, how people feel around you, how they perceive you. Like aesthetic isn't just what we're wearing. Like even my curly hair, do you know people judge me more for my curly hair because they think it looks unorganized compared to people with straightened hair or or they're perceived as more organized? Isn't that just like a racist thing? Yeah, definitely. It ties back to like mm -hmm. um, African women having curly hair and then European women having straight hair. I believe so. I believe it does. And that's the thing that like I'll get that in my comments sometimes where they're like, man, you could have at least tried to like you know, groom today talking about grooming. See, perception of grooming is like some people will perceive me as ungroomed, which is like a very interesting, you know? And then other people are like, oh my God, I love your curls. I wish I had curly hair. And I used to straighten my hair for so much of my life. I wish I had straight hair. And then in my, um, I don't know, early to mid twenties, I was like, okay, that's it. We're going natural. And then I just, from then on, and you know, it's just a part of being a person is like, you get to pick and choose. Like I have relatives or siblings or friends that are always like, um, cause it's very common to get a nose job to get rid of our bump and everything to make oh. our, like, it's like so common that it's like people's 18th birthday present sometimes. And oh, that's okay. a question I got asked a lot growing up. When are you getting your nose job? And I was like, oh, I'm thinking about it. I went to a doctor, talked to them about it, and I decided I'm not going to get it. And everyone's like, oh, okay. Like, that's, you know, that's your choice, of course. But, like, that 
that I, I felt like almost like a little rebellious in a way, but I honestly just didn't get it because I didn't think I'd look cuter. Mm. If I thought I'd look cuter, I would have gotten it. So what are all the ways that you've rebelled throughout your life with the way that you <sighs> externally express yourself? Girl, you know what story kept coming to my mind? So funny you asked me that. I distinctly remember, and this is, I don't think this is good necessarily. So Seattle is like a pretty nude friendly area. And they oh what a nude friendly area nude oh okay and so I remember going out one night to the dungeon it was nighttime and at night the area I was in was bars and lots of bars and stuff and I remember wearing like a very see through top and my my breasts were showing and I remember walking down the street and people passed by and they saw me and most people don't really react I've noticed they might say something or raise an eyebrow I'll be like boobs you know they might do, you know. But I remember thinking like, oh my God, like I don't even care that my tits are out and like I'm so free and I'm sitting here and I was thinking to what extent did I push that in a way that was like inappropriate? So I think about that story and how free I felt that night to a story where I remember being at a park and I remember being very like affectionate with one of my girlfriends and I remember like the PDA was too, was too much public displays of affection too much. And I was like, we are making out too much. But I was like, no one's going to tell me not to make out with my girlfriends. Like, I'm going to make out if I want to make out. And I realized there's a balance between feeling free in an appropriate setting and feeling like I have to push my freedom on other people because I feel like these people are secretly not going to let me be myself, even though Seattle's a very gay friendly area. So the irony, I think, is where is that balance between being myself and being a community member. And I think you learn that by realizing you're being inappropriate, but what you're doing isn't inappropriate. It's the context in which you're expressing yourself. So throughout mm -hmm. my life, I felt like I was figuring out like, when is the appropriate moment to be myself? When is it appropriate to be myself? And I think ultimately it's most of the time always appropriate to be myself in private. And it's somewhat appropriate to be myself in public and more or less I think that's the that's the conclusion I've come to is that at home I get to be 100% myself, completely unmasked, no limitations, no like I don't have to say or do anything without yeah, I can just be myself. But in public, at work, anytime I'm being perceived by another person, anytime it is not only about me, I have to be considerate. Mm -hmm. And slightly fearful of consequences, but mostly considerate, I feel. And I feel like that's the struggle we're all having at different parts of our life. When do I get to be authentic? And the, the answer is probably only in private. What mm -hmm. do you think? What about you? This is so, a concept I've been exploring a lot lately with other neurodivergence is the concept of self-awareness. Um, because self-awareness is different than introspection to me. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the times autistic folks can be so painfully self-aware to a point where we're used to observing ourselves and making our choices from a third person point of view. We're constantly viewing ourselves in the environment from a zoomed out perspective in terms of what is this going to look like? How are people going to perceive it? And how do I want to um, respond and be in that space? And you know, for example, making out and having a lot of PDA at the park because you want to send the message of like, I'm free and no one can make me feel guilty or bad. But then asking yourself the question of if no one was here to see this, would I do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I really don't know because I'm so used to basing my decisions off of the message that I want to send to other people and things like that. Totally. And I noticed this a lot with neurodivergence is, you know, having to remind them of just put yourself back into your body, live your life from first person point of view, do things because you want to do it, not because of how others are going to process and judge it. So um, I'll ask a lot of neurodivergence this question. When you walk away from social interactions, do you ask yourself, you know, what, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Did I do something wrong? How do they perceive it? How do I think they, um, you know, process what my actions were, what I said, and did I do a good enough job? And it's like, you're going down that list of like how you're perceived in the space by the other person. It's like all this painful amount of self-awareness when in reality, you should just ask yourself two questions. Was I kind and was I understanding, you know, just that kind of stuff, because that can look different for everyone. 
And as long as you do what you could do to honor your value system of I was kind and kind to me is just listening and understanding someone and being um, an active listener and all that kind of stuff. Um, then that's all I could really do, despite whether or not that other person received it accurately, even if they didn't like that's not my job, because all I could do is control myself. Right. Um, and I feel like being able to return that power back to yourself in a sense of like, I said this the other day during my session and my client laughed. I was like, cause it sounds really stupid when I say it out loud. I was like, sometimes you just have to choose ignorance as an autistic adult. Like it doesn't mean you don't know any better. It doesn't mean that you're oblivious. It just means you get to a point where self-awareness is um, harming you and it's not even helpful objectively. And you choose to not continue to process it and have it inform your actions. At some point you set it aside and be like, there's going to be people that will misjudge me, project onto me, dislike me. At the end of the day, I'm going to choose to be ignorant to that yeah, because I'm going to drive myself insane and get chronically ill and disabled. So I'm just going to do what I could do to honor myself. If problems arise, I confront it if and when it comes to my attention. And even then I do what I can to, you know, listen and reassure the other person of my intentions. But if they still don't want to understand, like that's also out of my control. So at some point I choose to let go of that too. But I feel like there's just so much responsibility that neurodivergence place onto ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Through being painfully self-aware. I like the distinction between self-awareness and introspection because I, I do think, um, yeah, people are almost overthinking or like thinking about it. Not that you, there's a way to think correctly, but I do think there's a way to think efficiently and like more correctly in a sense that actually helps you, you know, not even well, sort of in relation to looping and stuff like that. But are you dissecting information and coming to good conclusions or are you coming to bad conclusions based off bad thinking patterns? And I think that's really difficult. I mean, gosh, I t ask myself all the time. I'm going to review this conversation in my head a thousand times. Like I had a YouTuber reach out to me and they were like, hey, can we like talk again? I feel like I could have done better in that convo. I was like, I feel like I could have done better. That's perfect because like we are both feeling like, man, I really wish I had said this and I wish we had expressed this and I wish we had dive dove into this. And so it's kind of nice to know that all of us are just in some ways. But, but you know what's cool is like when you take action after it, when you say, I think I could have done better here and then you do better versus oh, I think I could have done better here, but there was nowhere to improve. You did great. It's like, do you know the difference? And I think introspection helps you know what you're observing. It like allows you to actually come to good conclusions based off good data. Versus like just moving off of your fear and using that to come to conclusions. Um, now I'm curious. Oh, I will say Don't I have me. to be, I have an appointment at 1130. So I if was we could just going to ask you about your spoons and if we should wrap up. Perfect. Okay, great, great, great. So at this point in the convo, I feel like we did sufficiently cover lots of things. We're almost at two hours. I'm very confident. Is there anything else we should talk about before we head out? And of course, people can leave comments. We can make another podcast. But I think we covered a lot today. Yeah. Is there anything else yeah. we should cover? I guess I just want to clarify, you know, self-awareness is the observation of how you fit into the space and environment around you. It's very superficial in a sense, but even then it's not horrible. Like it, it's actually important to a certain extent to be a community member, mm. but introspection is different because it's what is your internal world like and how does it feel or what does it think in relation to your experiences in the outside world? So I think it's important to have both. I think if anything, um, there's a certain point in which you have to draw boundaries with self-awareness because there comes a point where self-awareness is almost not even helpful anymore. And I think the issue is that our society has trained a lot of neurodivergence to only have self-awareness while simultaneously not having introspection because, again, our society doesn't enable us to introspect, period, because it doesn't want you to be nuanced and be yourself. So... I think the key here is to, again, draw boundaries with the amount you're self-aware while also integrating introspection back into your life, you know? Yeah. And I will say on that, I don't think society is always doing it out of maliciousness. I think they think they're yeah. helping you. But if your yeah. brain works differently, then you got to use advice that works for your brain 
versus whoever they think they're giving advice to because it's not going to work the same and it's going to feel even more alienating. It's like they point out that we're aliens and then they're like making it worse. So if you're a little bit different, know that many people are the same as you. They might just not be a part of the greater society, but we're still a part of society. We are here. We are voting. We are society. We pay taxes like everybody else. So, you know, Okay, with that said, Irene, thank you so much for joining me. What a great podcast. And I look forward yeah, this to was the so next fun. time. It was so good. It was so good. Yeah. All right, girly. Then I'll see you the next time. Thank you for being here. Everybody, leave your comments in the sections down below and check out Irene's channel, The Thought Spot. All right. Bye. Bye.